as you can see, I have Space Mike in the studio. I'm super excited that you're here. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's so oh awesome to be in your studio. This is, oh, this is so, so cool. So for those of you guys that watch the Tomorrow Show that we do on Saturdays, Space Mike over here is my co-host who always usually covers the rocket launches mm -hmm. as re more recently um, launch minute. So I want to talk all about rockets in this video because a lot of you guys have been asking me about um, specific rocket questions, cover uh, rocket boosters. So we're going to go over all of that today. Really excited for this. So the first one I actually want to ask you is like where you really started with your passion for rockets and um, where did you first get your interest? Honestly. When I was a little kid, I was really big into sci-fi, specifically Star Trek. And my favorite part of Star Trek was the spaceships. But, you know, we had they had warp drive and they were able to go all these different stars. And I'm just like, well, we don't have warp drive. And so as a little kid, I didn't necessarily want to be an astronaut. I wanted to be the captain of my own starship. And I didn't really care what NASA was doing, but I thought it was cool still. But it wasn't until I became an adult and I started looking up what was actually going on because, you know, it doesn't look like anytime soon we'd have that type of Star Trek future. So it's like, well, what is NASA doing? And as an adult, being able to understand a lot more of what's going on, first off, I was just like, whoa, the International Space Station is amazing. Yeah. And how do we do all this? And yeah. looking into the space shuttle and looking into how we got there. And it's the history of how we got there that hooked me. You know, lear learning about Werner von Braun and starting off with the V2 rockets and how that's the grandfather of all the space rockets nowadays yeah. and from that rocket they were able to develop you know bigger and better technologies better rocket engines better combustion chambers and get to the point where we could start launching the first satellites into space and then start launching the first people into space yeah. and the developments going on between Russia and America at that time were just insane we made so many leaps and bounds in rocket technology I mean we went from the V2 rocket in the 40s to having the Saturn V in the 60s and the Saturn so V cool. still to this day it is one of the most powerful rockets that has wow. ever flown. So let's go into that a little bit the like the the stats and the analytics of both different rockets the both rockets. So what would be the biggest um, contrast between the the V2 rocket and the Saturn V rocket? Oh my gosh, just size, just sheer size. size. Yeah, yeah just difference. just yeah, the I mean you you could you could take pictures with people next to the V2 rocket and you know they're like half the size of, of the V2 wow. and then you can barely see a person you know next barely to the Saturn v. yeah yeah they don't even, it doesn't even hardly compare okay what about the engines the engines it's really interesting because the engines are really similar they mm -hmm. burn the same type of fuels and because Werner von Braun was the designer for it he just kept scaling things up and improving on his design and originally it's really interesting how we got to the Saturn V so with the V2, he made it bigger, better, and we called that the Redstone rocket here in America. It was our first ICBM. And the Redstone rocket is actually the first rockets that the original Mercury missions flew on. But they were just suborbital rockets. They weren't quite powerful enough to get all the way into orbit. So he made a bigger, better version of that called the Jupiter. We didn't actually use the Jupiter for the any Jupiter. missioners. Yeah, the Jupiter rocket. I don't think I've ever heard of that one. Yeah, the Jupiter yeah. rocket. It was also known as the Juno rocket. And they would call it the Juno rocket whenever it was launching satellites, the first early satellites into space for NASA, because wow. NASA was embarrassed that Werner von Braun was the designer because he was a former Nazi. Wow. So it was yeah. kind of bad press that, oh, we, we don't want to use the Nazi rocket to get our satellites into space. Wow. In fact, we could have beat the Russians to get the, our, our satellite, Explorer 1. We could have gotten that into space months before Russia, maybe even a year year before Russia got Sputnik 1 into space. Really? Yeah. But because of politics, that's what really held us back. Yeah, we didn't want to use the Nazi wow. rocket. At that time, Werner von Braun was working for the United States Army. Huh. But the Navy and the Air Force were both developing their own rockets. And we wanted wow. to see if that would work first. The Navy was developing a, a rocket called Vanguard, and it just kept Vanguard. blowing up on the pad, blowing up on the pad, because oh. they didn't 
They were they were literally starting from scratch. Whereas wow. Werner von Braun, I mean, he'd been in rocketry clubs ever since he was a teenager. Wow. Were it, you ever in a rocketry club? I was never in a rocketry um, club. No, I did do try it, like some of the little hobby rockets and stuff. Yeah. But there are really big clubs all over the place that they launch huge really? ones. Yeah. Uh, and some of the stuff that Jared Head does, one of yeah. our other hosts on yeah. tomorrow, he he does the one of the clubs out here. And just some of the ones that he's built are, are huge. You know, they're you, so cool. he has to fit them in the. <laughs> yeah, fit him into the back of his Jeep or something like that. So but, cool. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So now, um, from your knowledge base, right, as far as what you've researched with <laughs> rockets, everything that you've done for the Tomorrow Show, um, and even outside of that, your own research uh, on rockets, what would you say um, are some of the most uh, powerful rockets that actually exist on the planet? Most powerful ones that exist today would probably be Falcon Heavy. Now okay. that that's operational, that's yes. one of the that's one of the tops, um, and that is just a little bit more than the Delta IV Heavy. Okay. Um, and then of course there's the Proton rocket, the Russian. Proton, proton rocket. rocket that okay. one's pretty powerful that can get to, um, I think it's around 50 50 tons to, to lower to orbit I think okay um, and then aside from that I mean we can keep going down the list I think the next mm -hmm. uh, biggest rocket after that would be the Ariane 5 that ESA launches okay and then from there it's just you know a couple of tons less couple of tons less you know going okay. to like the long March 5 from China and then going back to Russia for like Angara 5 and then to India they have their GSLV mark 3 okay. and just keep Keeps on kind of going down the list until we get to the the, the kind of small class launchers or medium class launchers. So let's like break down the definition of that. You see, you were mm -hmm. talking about tons, and and I I know a little bit about that, meaning like how much weight it can really thrust, right? How much mm -hmm. how much payload it can really handle and bring up into low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So um, I know the BFR is, is going to be around 100 tons. So what really classifies each rocket's um, strength? Depending, it depends on its tons and its payload. Is that how it how it works? Yeah, how much payload it can get to different orbits too. Different orbits. So okay. a lot of times the, the 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 tonnage to orbit that you see is just for low Earth orbit. Okay. And that's below 500 kilometers uh, ab above the surface. Okay. So anything above that um, is around medium Earth orbit, and that goes all the way up until you get to the the the, the high Earth orbit, and then eventually geosynchronous orbit. Got it. Um, and so a lot of the tons to orbit. It's just that low Earth orbit. But then what type of orbit do you want? Do you want uh, circular orbit right. or do you want sun synchronous orbit, which is a polar orbit? And well, there's polar orbits and then there's sun synchronous orbits. The difference is that they're both kind of in that high inclination, but they're off in, in such a way so that as they're they're uh, rotating in their orbit around Earth and the Earth is spinning, they'll constantly be in sunlight. Oh, and they'll okay. never go in sun the Earth's shadow. Oh, That's why it's I called sun synchronous cool. orbit so the That's solar great. panels will always be collecting energy from the sun the whole thing too like small class launchers is any anything between like one kilogram up to I, I think it's around 20 tons to, to low earth orbit wow. and then you have your medium class launchers that lets that's like the Atlas 5 mm -hmm. or the the Delta 2 that was more of like a light class launcher but with all okay. of the solid rocket boosters it could kind of get to that medium class so anything between like 20 to, to I, I think it's around 50 um, okay. uh, is a, a medium class medium rocket class and then anything above 50 is a heavy class rocket got that yeah. that's so cool and so now in order to even like thrust and bring all this weight up uh, into these different orbits you need a lot of engines so I want to talk a little bit about the different engines that you're familiar with mm. um, as far as what we need to get to Mars and then also what engines have been used in the past it really depends because there's there's two different types of engines when you're talking rockets. Okay. There's sea level engines and then there's vacuum engines. Oh. Sea level engines are designed to work in the atmosphere and they the, the amount of thrust that they produce is the maximum amount that it possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get the same amount of thrust whether you're in space or on the ground. Vacuum engines are going to be really powerful in space but really weak on the ground. You don't want to use vacuum engines on the ground. And the difference that you'll see, like for example SpaceX, they have nine engines on, on the bottom of their Falcon 9 rocket that are the Merlin Ds. They also have one Merlin engine for their upper stage, the second mm -hmm. stage. Right. But the, the bell of the, of the nozzle has been extended and is much, much wider. And what that does is that cr causes it to have more thrust in space because it doesn't have to push against any atmosphere while the thrust is coming 
coming out. So it's vacuum optimized is what they call it. But that wide of an area of, of thrusting out that, that much uh, uh, rock, rocket fuel from that area, if you were in an atmosphere would generate wouldn't generate as much thrust. That's why you kind of want to tighten the beam, so to speak, to, to huh. get that thrust as, as tight as you can right. so that its pressure is really, really strong. It's kind of like a bottle rocket. If right. you have just a really tiny, tiny hole on a bottle rocket, that thing is going to shoot off. Yeah. But if you have a really wide hole on it, it might just kind of go off a little bit before, right. or, or not at all. Right. So okay. it's the same type of thing with rockets. Oh, okay. I get that. I get that. So then as far as the difference, the, what kind of engine would be needed then to get us to Mars? To get to Mars? I mean, that depends on what you want to send to Mars. And that's, okay. that goes back into the whole class of, you know, the, the tonnage and stuff like that. You know, a, a medium class rocket that can send, you know, let's say 40 tons to low Earth orbit could probably send like two or less tons to Mars. Okay. So it really depends. And when you're launching too. They talk about that two year window when you're yeah. launching to Mars. So so you could do it with technically any of the engines that exist. You could do it with solid rockets or you could do it with liquid rockets. And solid rockets, I mean, they're just mm -hmm. using um, chemicals that are already compacted together and then all you have to do is ignite them and, and they'll just burn all the way through the, the solid rocket as it's burning. What are those chemicals? Uh, it depends too, it's yeah, different. It's, it's uh, HTBP H is a, a real common one, which is, I don't remember what it stands for, but it's, okay. it's like a, it's like a type of plastic that's uh, that's refined plastic Okay, um, but there are also like engines that use kerosene as yeah, well, right? Yeah, those are liquid engines. Those are liquid engines, yeah. okay. And the difference with those is, oh, just like the little hobby rockets, those are solid yeah. rockets. The, all that saltpeter oh. and gunpowder that's packed in there, that's your fuel and oxidizer. And you just have to light it on fire and all of that will burn through. The, okay. Those little hobby rockets with that gunpowder packed into yeah. it, imagine a really giant version of that. Those big wow. white rockets that were on the side of, of the the space shuttle yeah. those are solid rockets right the fuel was solid packed in there packed do you need chemicals. an oxidizer for the liquid as well you do with the, with the why liquid do you need an oxidizer the reason why you need an oxidizer is because even though your fuel might be flammable it might not necessarily be combustible mm, okay. so it might light on fire but it might not create an explosion so if you have an oxidizer the way that rockets work is that you have two tanks you have your fuel and your oxidizer and they'll have two lines that It'll go down together into a combustion chamber and there will be some something on the inside it might even be as simple as a spark plug like you'd use on a car uh -huh. that is, is generating some sort of spark to ignite those fuels once those fuels touch each other they have that chemical interaction that makes them combustible highly combustible okay. in their liquid form so the biggest thing to do is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen when you put those chemicals together what is that yeah, that's water. That's water. That's water. Exactly. Water's not combust. Yeah. Water doesn't it's explode. Not, no. Yeah. But if you s chemically separate those two elements, yeah. they're usually in gases. Yeah. And if you pressurize them down, really pressurize mm -hmm. them down, then they become in a liquid state. It's in their liquid state that they are highly flammable. Wow. Liquid okay. oxygen. I mean, air isn't doesn't just light on fire, yeah. but in its liquid state, it does. And so uh, when you recombine okay. those two elements in a highly densified pressurized liquid form yeah they're highly combustible and that it chemical interaction is highly energetic. So you have your combustion chamber. Right. That's not the nozzle. That's not the engine bell. The combustion chamber is just a little bit above that where the controlled explosion is actually happening. And then they're letting that controlled explosion vent out. In a certain through, direction and that's what causes a... That's what causes the thrust. The yeah. thrust to push whatever is above it. Right. In, Into space. What, in whatever direction it's okay. going. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So for, for that a concluding thought, right? Yeah would be getting to Mars. <laughs> getting to Mars, okay. So what would we need to get to Mars and um, how are we gonna do it? To get to Mars, we need a really big rocket. Okay. We need lots of rocket fuel. And if we wanna come home, I mean, if we're talking about sending people, mm -hmm. we wanna be able to come home too. So we need to be able to have a way to either refuel or have a vehicle that's small enough and trim enough that it has enough fuel brought along with it 
Mm -hmm. to be able to land on the surface, take off, and spend all the what's called delta V to return back to Earth. Wait, the, why the, is it called delta V? That's the amount of thrust that you need. That's okay. the amount of thrust that you need to get to where you want to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if I want to get from point A to point B, how much thrust do I need to get there? Got and, it. you know, that's, the, you know, how much, how heavy am I? Right. You know, and how much energy will it take to get, you know, however much I weigh yeah. to get to this point? Okay. Mm -hmm. So then if you don't have enough of um, fuel then, what would be the alternative option? You'd have to be able to refuel. And so that's why SpaceX, Blue Origin, and so many other companies are looking at methane, methane engines, engines. Because you can harvest methane through the carbon dioxide that's all over Mars. So cool. Yeah. In the wow. same way that we create liquid oxygen and liquid uh, hydrogen from wow. water, from you can do the same thing with uh, carbon dioxide to create liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Wow. Yeah. So if you guys want to get to Mars, just get a giant rocket and some liquid methane <laughs> boosters yeah. rocket engines yeah awesome it's really cool. yeah yeah that's amazing awesome well thank you so much for taking the time thanks uh, for asking these questions yeah 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 for sure so tell everybody where we can find you you guys have to subscribe <laughs> to his channel by the way <laughs> you can find me at youtube.com slash epic future space And then you can catch the both of us at youtube.com slash TMRO. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much again for coming. Yeah. And we will talk to you guys next time. Bye. Bye.